Yeah, welcome back and we're continuing the conversation with the World Bank's plan to invest over 5 billion naira within the next five years to help restore degraded landscapes, improve agricultural productivity and promote livelihoods across 11 African countries. The World Bank Group President David Malpas in a statement from the bank on Thursday said this investment would help improve livelihoods and that as countries recover from COVID-19. He also said that more than $5 billion in financing would support agriculture, biodiversity, uh, community development, food security, landscape restoration, job creation, resilient infrastructure, rural mobility, access to renewable energy, and so much more. We're now being joined by economic analyst Mukta Mohammed and head of tax PwC Taiwo Oyedele uh, to discuss this. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Thank morning. you for having me. Yes. Let's begin with Mr. Oyedele. The, the World Bank is making a huge investment here. But how serious do you think you know, African countries you know, take the issues of uh, climate change and biodiversity? Yeah, I think just to be blunt, I'll say we're not taking issues of biodiversity uh, and the environment seriously enough in Africa. And Nigeria is clearly a good uh, case study for that. Um, we, we developed a renewable energy uh, master plan in 2015. And if you look at that master plan, you would say it's a good document, uh, which is always what you find in Nigeria. We are brilliant, we have good ideas, but we don't do well in implementation. Uh, something as simple as granting import duty and VAT waiver on importation of equipment or renewable energy, we haven't been able to implement that fully uh, after about six years. You also find that most times we don't realize that the biggest impact we can make as a people and as a government is not it's not going to come from the money that we spend. It will come from the policies that we introduce. So even the investment by the World Bank, if you look at it on the average, is less than $500 million per country. That will not change our story when it comes to biodiversity. So it doesn't look like a priority to us as a people. Nigerians, for example, want energy, and they can't be bothered whether it's clean energy or not. They just want energy. Hmm. Mr. Right. Mukta Mohammed, do do you agree that we don't take the issues of you know environmental, uh, you know biodiversity, renewable energy, and all of this seriously in in Africa? Definitely, I I, I can both agree with what he has said about that. Uh, you know, it's in Africa we are not looking at biodiversity. We are suffering from hunger. We are looking for what to eat. And so when the environment is going to provide that food, why not? So African countries are leaders, like you said, policies are not there. And even when they are there, implementation is very difficult because uh, how do you tell an hungry man that he doesn't have any means of getting a, 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 a gas from, from the guy's power plant is not running through his place and you're telling him that he, he cannot um, 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 eat food that day because he has to wait for renewable energy. In the villages, as well in the rural areas, they go to get the firewood, and those are part of the challenges with climate change. So I, I can't but agree with him, but I think the major problem in Africa is hunger. So when you address hunger, that's why we begin to think about biodiversity, how it affects our environment. It's a man that I've eaten that will be thinking of, of um, um, pre preserving the climate, and you make him believe that the climate is actually what will provide food for him and table. So, we need a lot of education, but before the education, you need to provide the means of livelihood for them so that they will be able to have food on their table. Then you begin to educate them on biodiversity, how they're affecting the environment, how it can reduce their food uh, food and production, and then cause more hunger in the land. They need education on that, but the first thing you need to do is to give them food to eat. Okay, um, um, Mr. Mukhtar Mohammed, I'm going to continue with you. The um, investment, of course, is coming, you know, as a result of, you know, what the World Bank has noticed with regards to uh, climate change um, and, of course, uh, COVID-19 and its effects on uh, the economies in these uh, African countries. Um, share with us, you know, your thoughts on how much of a crisis, you know, African countries might be walking into 
um, from what it seems. Like you've mentioned, climate change is not one of the biggest conversations down here because we, you know, we'll address hunger first. Um, but how much of a crisis may we be walking into with our economies and with survival and with hunger um, as, um, you know, as a continent? We're already in a huge crisis as a continent. Uh, the, the only thing that is helping us as a continent is the resilience of the people. In terms of policy, in terms of uh, 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 um, stimulus from all African countries, we're not just talking about Nigeria now, if you look at all African countries, it has nothing to do by The only one we've seen that you could say it has something to do, maybe the South African economy because it's a very structural economy. And then you all, outside of South African economy, African economics are not really structured. So once you don't structure an economic intervention to reach the, the bottom, is very difficult. So what we are seeing now, we are addressing the, the pandemic issue from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top. So we definitely have a, a, a big challenge. We have weak structures. We have weak institutions. We have weak, we, we don't have infrastructure. So you, you, you will not be able to address this. So Africa is really in a very serious um, a, 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 a problem in terms of our economy as a result of this pandemic. The only thing the world was looking at in terms of the pandemic before was the health implication of the pandemic. They were looking at, oh, you have a lot of health challenge in Africa, you have a lot of people that will die from the pandemic. Nobody was looking at the other angle of, of, of survival of the people in terms of providing food for them, in terms of them having the means of livelihood, in terms of loss of job, how are they going to... Uh, I mean, um, help them in terms of loss of job, in terms of creating that environment again after the pandemic. Nobody, no, even the donor agents were not looking at that. They were looking only at how can we help them um, improve their health sector so that they will not have too much casualties in Africa. So when you look at that by and by now, whatever they are trying to do is not, it's more or less like a fire brigade approach because the other plan was, oh, improve their health sector so that they will not have this pandemic. Now you are beginning to realize that, oh, the health sector is not the, 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 the health sector is not really the problem now. What the people need now is, is job, and what the people need now is home, I mean food. And so you are beginning to rush in and say, how can we help that? So it's going to take time. Time. Government in Africa should begin to learn how to handle their own problem in the African way, because you cannot depend on stimulus the way stimulus is given in America, is given in developed nations. You need to look at the structure. How can you give your own stimulus? How can you help your economy? How can you help your people? What direct intervention can you do to them? So it's a different all game where we are trying to copy what the Western world is doing. We must look for an right. inbuilt African solution to, his, to, to, his, to the situation that we are, especially in this pandemic um, uh, um, year that we, from 2020 to even to 2021. Mm. Uh, it, it's a big challenge to the African, uh, African continent and it's a big challenge to the African government. But all the right. major challenge is because we have weak infrastructures, we have weak structures, and we have very poor institutions. Mm. Mr. Mokta, I'll be continuing that conversation with Mr. Oyedele right now. Uh, Mr. Oyedele, what he just mentioned is such a key issue, talking about African leaders coming together to you know, rally support, talking about stimulus, economic packages, and all of that for African countries. But you know, in the heat of this COVID-19 pandemic, what you see the AU doing is rallying supports for international donations. How about African countries coming together, pulling resources to you know, create an, a continental-wide approach or solution to, to the pandemic? What do you think about this? Yeah, thank you. Um, I do agree there's always uh, strength in unity. So if Africa can come together to address any challenge whatsoever, the outcome we will get will be better than if we are only tackling it uh, individually on a country by country basis. So to that extent, I would agree that Africa using the umbrella of the African Union needs to come together to address our challenges. So specifically with regards to uh, COVID-19 stimulus or whether you're talking about biodiversity or the environment, I would emphasize again that the biggest impact we will make in Africa will not come from the monies that governments would spend because those governments are already financially constrained. They don't have money. They don't have enough money. The entire budget of the federal government of Nigeria is not even enough to administer parity. So imagine the U.S. spending trillions of dollars, right? The U.S. is not even up to twice our population. So if you have that and you say Nigeria needs to spend even $500 billion, our budget for, for the past 10 years is not even up to that. So which means we then have to think about 
how can we make the best of our limited resources? How can we complement those efforts of government with sensible policies? And how can we ensure that we do not do certain things? Most times we focus on what we want to do. We don't talk enough a lot about what we shouldn't be doing. So government should not be borrowing money and give to NCA about $200 million. So government should not be borrowing money to fix rail. Rail is commercially viable. Provide the policy environment and let the private sector drive those so that government can focus their attention on social interventions. Uh, and I would say that we already have multilateral agencies such as the African Development Bank, uh, which is an African initiative where governments can even borrow to develop the economy, administer certain initiatives like recycling can be commercially viable. Hmm. You can allow private sector to do it or get it funded by those multilateral agencies. And to administer palliative for COVID-19 in view of our limited resources, it has to be targeted, which means only the people who need it the most will get it, as well as the sectors that are most vulnerable. To do that, you need data. We are not also great with data in Africa. So it's a long journey and we need to start now, and not only because of this pandemic, but because the reality of life is another one would happen. It may not be COVID, it will be something else. Would we be prepared at the time and what lesson would we have learned from this terrible situation we're going through? And it's, you know, it, it feels like, you know, it's, um, we're, we're in a loop. Um, you know, we keep asking about, you know, where we're going to, where we will be in the next decade. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, as a country, had many visions, vision 2000, vision 2010, 2020, we've had so many of them. Um, but the question really is, you know, how, you know, much better are we doing, you know, over time? Mokhtar Mohammed, I want you to quickly speak on, um, on this, you know, as briefly as possible. In 2017, the World Bank also announced a $57 billion um, investment in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm not sure how far they've gone with that or how much of it has been released. Um, do you think that we would ever get to a point where we, we you know, will stop, you know, needing these investments from the World Bank? Um, you know, to get or keep African countries running? I think uh, if you look at everything you've seen, you look at um, information on ground, you look at policy on ground, uh, you, 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 I don't think we'll get out of it. I think our government doesn't look for, they look for cheap, cheap, cheap solution to our problem. So when they just think of, uh, oh, is there any way we can borrow? There's no ingenuity in government, there's no creative thinking, there's no inward thinking. What government is looking for is where can we get this fund quickly? Where can we fix it? Because they are looking at the political solution, not the economic solution. What will they, what will I be remembered for before I leave office? A quick fix measure. So in a quick fix measure, you try to borrow as much as you can to fix it and not for forgetting about the payment plan because you might not be the one to pay it. You try to, you look at government, they try to negotiate that, oh, we have more momentum for that for the next 10 years. So at that time, my own, my own, my own government is out of there. So and I have been praised of developing a lot of things, and yet there's a lot of debt piling up for the incoming administration and other administrations to pay for over a project that I did. So I think until we begin to look inwardly, we begin to build capacity, especially in terms of leadership, leaders that would believe that the, um, the solution to our problems is inside of us, is within us. Mm. We have the right people to, take, to, to, to do that. But as long as we think on, we keep looking for handout, we keep looking for solutions from World Bank. We're not, and like you said, we have the African Development Bank, but all you see African leaders think of is try to run to World Bank, try to run to IMF. And when you look at the tunnel these days, they've gone to China. And when you look at the interest rate between these companies, this, this organization and the African Development African Development Bank was created for things like this. Yes. So Africa should look inwardly by to using the African Development Bank to build a stronger economy for Africa. Then Thank look you. inwardly, build our capacity to be able to take care of, uh, take opportunities that comes our way. Because a decay infrastructure is an opportunity for people to grow and also to empower your people. But what we see here, we see we helping other developed nations to empower their people to the decay of our infrastructure rather than empowering our people to the decay of our infrastructure. So we need to look inwardly, we begin to look inwardly, we need to look for solutions within ourselves. I think, like I said, we need an African solution to an African problem. Yes, Mr. Mokta. Thank you very much. But just something light but before we wrap up. You know, with all the resources in Africa, how soon do you think we can begin to, you know, loan money to the U.S., you know, invest in their own economy and all of that? Uh, just, just, just a quick take home. Thank you. You don't have to answer that. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Oyedele. Thank you very much, Mr. Mokta, uh, for your time on The Breakfast this morning. A pleasure being there. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, you know, you know, it would also be great to say, you know, maybe we should get to a point where we also get some of these World Bank loans and investments in science and technology, not just in agriculture all the time. You know, let, let's, let's also do some of the things. But, you know, once again, let's fix hunger first. Yes. Before we look at laptops and um, what they have to say. <laughs> let's stay alive. Um, exactly. It's, um, it's been a great morning. Thank you so much for joining us to every one of our guests who stopped by. Um, Alero Ayida Otobo, who spoke on uh, the fixed, fixed politics. politics initiative, Thanks, yes. uh, Mokhtar Mohammed, uh, Mr. Aoye Dili also, and of course, uh, God's Will Jumbo, much earlier in Bonnie Island story. Um, the news comes up next at 9 o'clock. Yes, Osarage Ogbama will be taking you through the headlines around the world and in Nigeria, especially. I am Aneta Felix. Osarage Ogbama, you can join us. Um, on social media at Plus TV Africa, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Same thing with our YouTube channel at Plus TV Africa. See you at nine. Goodbye. Have a great Friday.